Hello, and welcome to the Bitcoin Conference MENA. My name is Tracy Hoyos Lopez, and this is Arjun Sethi. He is the new and co CEO of Kraken. Now, Arjun, talk to me about Kraken in the Middle East. What are you guys up to here? Uh, so, we, I mean, we're a global exchange, and uh, we started in 2011. Uh, we started in 2011, and uh, we're a global exchange, so we actually operate worldwide. Um, but the, our, our main markets are U.S. and Europe, and we've been slowly expanding into the Middle East and uh, Asia. So what are you guys up to? What services exactly are you offering in the Middle East? Or if, you know what, what specific strategies are you implementing in the Middle East that drive user adoption in the MENA region? Yeah, I think what, uh, <clears throat> what most people kind of think about is retail consumer products. Um, the way that we've operated the exchange since day one has been for market makers, um, hedge funds, institutional traders. Uh, but more importantly, if you think about a company like Interactive Brokers, we've followed that route in terms of being able to provide liquidity. So if you look at most exchanges in the ecosystem, a lot of them have you know, wash trading or they're kind of manipulate the numbers. We've always been sort of secure, not hacked, um, and as transparent as possible. Okay, and then what is Kraken's vision for the future of Bitcoin amongst Bitcoin adoption amongst enterprises in the MENA region? I, I, think a, I think a better way to see what we facilitate today is not too indifferent from if you took a look at what Facebook did in the ecosystem or any other social networks is that they were able to proliferate a certain set of products. But more importantly, those products um, were like, they had ease of use for being able to connect. And so if you take a look at not just Bitcoin, but crypto, our, our whole thesis around how we're thinking about uh, fintech and financial services for people across the board is we have the strongest uh, liquidity in the ecosystem across Europe, United States, and, and over time, uh, Asia and Latin America is that like, how do we provide those rails for people that are building on top of us rather than having something that's monolithic and we own it? Okay, so that brings us then to scalability. So with how does Bitcoin's layer approach, right? How does it address scalability concerns, particularly in the Middle East? And are there any specific layer two solutions that Kraken is considering adopting to enhance its services in the region? I think if you look at volume, and I, you know the, the panel right before CZ had talked about Bitcoin, if you take a look at Bitcoin, it's, it's your on-ramp for liquidity into the ecosystem. Once you've got liquidity, then you have the ability for multiple people to interact in the ecosystem. And so I, I, think, a better way to, I think a better way to approach the, the crypto ecosystem is that everyone wants access to capital. And once, you've, once you have the ability to get access to capital, then you get access to products and services, then you have the ability to save, store, invest, and make money. And so at, there's you know, six billion people on earth. You've, you've got maybe about three and a half to four billion people that are not even just underbanked. They just don't have access to liquidity, access to capital. So when, when we think about what we want to have with our rails today, it's more about how do we provide that to every developer that's building the ecosystem, not just in DeFi, but even people that want to be able to stitch their way to DeFi. Now, Bitcoin has often been seen as a transformative tool for addressing global financial um, inequality, really. So, and it drives empowerment, right? Like you have um, all of these currencies suffering from massive inflation and you have had people in different regions of the world, for example, Africa or Venezuela, where they look at Bitcoin as the great equalizer. So when they talk about a, a, a Bolivar or a Peso, right, um, they can't talk about that in the same way that we say a dollar, right? But when they use Bitcoin, they're on the same place. They're on the same page as everybody else. Now, how is Kraken leveraging tools like, for example, stable coins and other technologies to address these challenges? So we're an exchange. At the end of the day, what we are going to care about is being facilitating uh, tokens. We're going to facilitate liquidity safely. I think uh, the way to sort of think about the world is everyone talks about the Fed. 
and the Fed is a um, you know a place where they, they literally mint money, right? And so there's a stability, there's a rule of law, not um, law that rules. And so when you think about uh, cryptocurrency, it's I mean Bitcoin is transparent. There's like a there's a belief in it, and then there's a motion towards being able to enact it. But the way to sort of think about how any of the monetary systems or the governments have been um, in play is that um, we believe in the system, we're voting for the system, and um, it's going to enact us to be able to transact. It's probably a better way to sort of think about it. And so if you think about what uh, cryptocurrency is going to be doing that's permissionless or um, is beyond borders and beyond government, it's very, it's very similar to the internet. So our whole focus is what are ways in which we can enact that rather than do it the other way around, which is um, to control it. Like, I guess the best way I think about it is every exchange that's been out there as a starting point um, has been uh, monopolistic or monolithic. And the way we think about it is that we're going to break up all these pieces. And so how are you planning on doing that? Uh, well, uh, providing APIs, stitching pieces together um, from traditional finance all the way into DeFi. Because what we want to be able to have happen is everyone who's building anywhere they are in the world is have access to that capital. Now, you're very big on AI, tech, right? You have a, a wide gamma of interests in the things that you do. And one of the things that I really wanted to talk to you about is the intersection of Bitcoin and AI. What do you see as that being the future? What, do you, what are the observations that you're seeing in that? And then how is Kraken playing a role in that space? Um, so um, the, the great thing about my role is uh, while I'm the CEO of Kraken, I also run Tribe Capital. And uh, we've invested in XAI. We've invested in um, uh, multiple companies that are focused on not just the infrastructure layer, but also the vertical application layer. And I think the, the way to sort of think about AI, um, without getting too deep into this, like I, I spent a lot of my time thinking about this, is that the, the way to sort of think about um, what's going to happen in the ecosystem is that one individual can start building um, at the power of 1,000, in my opinion. And I, and I think in the next couple of years, they'll be at the power of 10,000. So the way to sort of think about the intersection of crypto um, and the intersection of AI is how many more things can we do with prompting uh, the ability, again, access to capital, access to liquidity, access to be able to build. And so what you see right now is everyone's focused on, I can make a product cheaper or I can uh, reduce the cost of labor. A lot of what we're doing across the board for our portfolio or even at Kraken today is like, what are all the ways in which we can automate a lot of these pieces to be able to enable more development in the first place? And so what I'd said before was the proverbial thought right now is we have an exchange that's monolithic and we centralize everything. And the way in which we think about everything is like, how do we break apart pieces into microservices so that anyone can build on top of us? So then what you want is for people then to be able to use this technology by way of your platform to just keep building on top of this? Yeah, I think when I take a look at um, any of the layer ones or layer twos, um, while they might be decentralized, they're centralized in Notion. I think the way we want to be able to uh, promote this and to be able to stitch this again together anywhere in the world is how do you actually make this truly decentralized in the first place? And so what are all of our products and services that we have today? How do we break them apart? How do we stop having them again as a monolithic system? And how do we have, again, microservices that are much more um, decentralized for every team that's out there that's building? So for example, in, in India today or uh, in Southeast Asia today, there's a lot of um, focus again on um, here's the reserve currency, here's the way in which FinTech works. Uh, but if I want to be able to develop and have access to that liquidity or the rails that we already provide, how do I get them there as fast as possible? But more importantly, how do I just continue to reduce the amount of uh, fee stream, right? So like I'm not charging um, for every um, transaction. How do I just re remove that limit completely? But that seems like it's more, right, and, and educate me on this, but it seems like then the utilization of AI sort of centralizes it more as opposed to decentralizing it. There's a, there's a way to sort of think about, um, from a Star Wars perspective, there's the, the Empire and there's, there's the Rebels. Uh, I, th I think the way to sort of think about that, AI is moving in the same direction, which is <clears throat> there's a set of folks that are building um, for the rebels. I consider that uh, XAI. And there's a set of folks that are sort of centralizing it. And I think of that as open AI, at least today. And so 
uh, when you think about open source development, when you think about the speed at which you can have innovation or the speed at which you can build, uh, that's where I think the winners are going to be. So, okay, so when you are talking about then open source AI, or I'm sorry, op yes, and then um, I'm, I'm talking about XAI. I'm talking about permissionless building. Right, so crypto stands for that, open source stands for that, and then open source um, uh, LLM stand for that as well. And what's the impact of that in a region like MENA? I, I think the way to, I think the way to sort of phrase this is that you have a large swath of people that have not been trained in um, uh, traditional computer science. And uh, the same way that, like, I grew up during a time where I started coding QBasic, and then I started learning traditional ways of uh, arithmetic all the way to here's how you sort of think about computer science. And then there's a wave of folks that have sort of learned how to code through YouTube or, uh, or these uh, tutor pilot systems. And then there's, an, there's a new wave now that's happening where I call it like a human language coding, which is like through these LLMs you're able to start building. Now start thinking about uh, human language coding or the ability to think about what you want to enact or, or have out there in the world through the lens of what uh, crypto enables you to do, again with like large distribution and large uh, uh, programmable uh, monetary solutions, which is not something that you had before. So this would be rather transformative then for developing economies? I, I think what most people don't get is the majority of transactions and the majority of engagement that you see is all in emerging economies. Expand on that. So stable coins, right, in Argentina um, or, uh, or like all of Latin America or Nigeria where there's like 90% of folks have started um, you know, dabbling in stable coins. It's Bitcoin is the on-ramp and then they move into stable coins. Um, like I, I started a bank in Mexico where we serve uh, merchants, about, about 800,000 of them between Mexico, per Peru, and uh, Colombia. And the only thing they care about is being able to move uh, money uh, for the SKUs that they have for farming. So if they're selling strawberries between Colombia, Mexico, and US, um, that corridor is really important. If, they're, if they need to move invoicing or uh, uh, money through each middleman, they're spending 1%, 3%, 7%. So if you move 100 million a year, you're spending a lot of money just to move goods and services. So when you start thinking about what stable coins uh, give you the ability to do, when you start thinking about what like, remittances of it, uh, gives you the ability to do, um, or just the average individual that's like walking around, when you, when you had talked about, hey, there's currency you know, issues in some of these countries, inflation, et cetera, all of these folks, all they care about is storing and saving, and then after that they can start thinking about what um, life can look at in terms of investing. So you mentioned remittances, and in the world of remittances, right, crypto and Bitcoin become a very big deal. Why, why is that? What makes it so attractive? Well, if you, so you have, um, if you take a look at the total uh, transactions with B2B and uh, B2C, you've got like, trillions of dollars that move uh, through banks and um, through intermediaries. And they all take a spread, right? Like we all kind of uh, understand what that looks like. And then there's a spread of currencies and then there's a spread on um, at the one end versus the other end. What, what's really important is that if I am, let's just say here in UAE, if, I, if I'm from Bangladesh or Pakistan or India or Southeast Asia or Philippines, if I'm sending money back and forth, um, the, the spread that I, have, I might get charged on any given day might be five to seven percent, but it can be upwards of se like fourteen percent. So if you're if you're sending uh, you know between seven and you know fifteen dollars for every hundred dollars that you send back home, that that's a huge amount that um, doesn't need to be there in the first place. Um, now you can think about what are all the countries where that happens. USA, Mexico is a, another large corridor. Um, UAE to all of the Southeast Asian. Um, U.S. to Philippines, U.S. to India, you know, U.K. to India. You, I just, I can keep going down the line. Um, that's just on the P2P side. On the, the B2B side, it's even larger. So when you think about what crypto does, what Bitcoin does, and the speed at which you can make those transactions happen, you're talking about BIPs. You're not talking about large percentages. 
So should we expect then that the amount of money going into different countries, um, particularly from the United States, which is more where the remittances are coming from, with the use of both crypto and Bitcoin, that it would increase as opposed to, I know that uh, a couple of the countries this year took a massive hit in the amount of money that's been sent from the US into them. I think Egypt is one of them. So should we see an increase now with the utilization of Bitcoin and crypto? Yeah, I mean, if, if your on-ramp is a stable coin and then you've saved, you know, a couple hundred bucks um, as like a, a taxi driver, then what's the next thing that you want to sort of think about? Are you going to think about stocks and traditional equities? It's possible. Or are you going to think about the on-ramp for crypto that you got into in the first place? Um, and so my, I think the, the natural thought's going to be the law of supply and demand is that you're going to take a look at Bitcoin, Ethereum, and the rest of the layers that are out there that you're going to invest into because the on-ramp is already there. And so... You know, if, if you, uh, I travel a lot and I usually travel pretty low key. And if you, if you see some of the, you know, the, the Uber drivers in Latin America, they've got their, um, uh, their driver app and then they have their crypto trading app on the side. Uh, and any, and their, their total deposit base there isn't anything but stable coins today. Arjun, thank you so much. We are so excited to see what the future of uh, Kraken holds. And thank you so much for taking the time to speak to us today. Thank you. Is your company ready for the next evolution in financial strategy? Bitcoin for Corporations is your partner in securing the future of your business. With exclusive membership benefits, our comprehensive masterclass, and a network of trusted service providers, we provide the insights and resources to help you incorporate Bitcoin into your financial strategy, ensuring stability and long-term value. Strengthen your business. Innovate with confidence. Bitcoin for corporations, protecting your treasury and positioning you for the future.